We've witnessed some very harmonious thinking the past few days in the various messages, the expressions and thoughts that the brethren have presented about the exalted Christ. And I give thanks for that. I give thanks that we are seeing an example of speaking the same thing, having the same mind and judgment. We've witnessed an example of this. You've noticed that uh, one brother has already preached on this text that I have, Brother Jeremy Williams preached on this subject, and I give thanks that we're able to reaffirm these things. Showing, I think the Lord just really wants us to emphasize these things more than once, and it's a good opportunity to see how like-minded me and Brother Jeremy are. Not very much anticipated hearing and speaking about the exalted Christ Jesus. We're talking about the Jesus that's in heaven right now, sitting at the right hand of God. That's who we're talking about. Now, normally when you hear about Jesus today, I mean, people do talk about him. You normally hear a lot about his earthly ministry, hearing about his death, some may bring up his resurrection, and his ascension into heaven. And it is sad, though, that many apply the brakes at the point of the ascension. It's kind of like a question mark past that point. Jesus did come in the earth. He did give his life a ransom for many. It's good to speak these things. It's good to know what Jesus did in the earth. It's good to know he's raised from the dead. He took upon the, himself the sins of the world, paid the penalty, and then he has ascended into heaven. But what has happened as a result of that, though? Like, where, what is Jesus doing now, though? We know what he did, but what now? Is he still the man of sorrows? Is that his name on the right hand of God? Is he still lowly and humbled, despised? This is in the picture presented in the scriptures. Christ certainly was humble and lowly at one time, but he's much greater and mightier state than he was when he was in the earth. Amen. Now, our main text, you'll see quite a misprint in the schedule. According to it, it's Ephesians 1, chapter, or chapter 1, 19 through 210. But, unfor but, I, but to relieve you, it's not that lengthy of a passage for me. It's only be three verses. I'll be starting at verse 19, speaking of the exceeding greatness of his power to usward, who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Now, that's not a lowly position. Now, let's think about something real quick. Like, what did Jesus accomplish when he came to the earth? Let's just browse that real quick. He came in the form of a servant. Yet, evil spirits trembled at his presence. Isn't that what they told him when he came to them? Leave us alone! Have you come to torment us before the time? They said that to a humbled Christ. The devil tried to tempt him after he fasted 40 days in a weakened state. And he couldn't get him to sin against God. He was taken, nailed to a cross, mocked by those around him. While on the cross he became sin for us, having all transgressions of the world laid on him and paid the penalty for the sins of the entire world. He did not remain dead. He raised from the dead, and death does not dominate him. Because of this, men now everywhere are commanded to repent, for now they have a propitiation for their sins. Jesus successfully reconciled us to God by removing what hindered us from coming. Because of him, we can be forgiven for our transgressions and not live in sin any longer. Now, he did that in his weakest state. If he could accomplish so great a task in his weakest state, what can he accomplish in his strongest state? The Jesus I'm talking about is not a lowly one. Rather, he's the exalted one. I speak of Jesus who is highly exalted and given a name above every name. I speak of Jesus who is King of kings and Lord of lords. I speak of Jesus, our great high priest. I speak of Jesus who is in, seated at the right hand of God and interceding on our behalf. I speak of Jesus to whom it was said by God, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. That's the Jesus I'm talking about. Jesus humbled himself in order to take the sins of the world away, but he is sure not in a humbled state now. He's king over all and he's reigning over all. Now in verse 20 here, you read that God set him at his own right hand. That's what it says. He has set him at his own right hand in the heavenly place. A set. That's, he placed him there. He put him there. He made him sit there. He gave him that seat. 
This shows that this isn't the result of random or spurious choice. Eeny, meeny, miny, it's you, Jesus. That's not how he was picked. This was not like an, like an election of some kind. Okay, we have all the qualified people for Savior of the world. All who say Jesus is the Savior of the world, let's have a show of hands. This isn't how Jesus was picked. This was the result of the eternal purpose of God. God willed this to be the case, not an accident or coincidence. God worked this out. Now, Jesus certainly didn't become seated at the right hand of God by usurpation or brute force. We already have a record of someone who attempted to obtain power by this means. That being Lucifer himself, the prince of the power of the air, that old serpent, the lion who roams about seeking whom he may devour. It was Satan who so arrogantly proclaimed, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That's, what he, that's, his object, that's quite an objective. Indeed, the devil tried hard to obtain this thing that he desired. He was not casual about this, so much that he won over a third of the angels and caused war in heaven. He fought with Michael and his angels, but the dragon, as he's named in Revelation, was unsuccessful in his attempt to be like the most high. Did not achieve that goal. He was cast out of heaven. As Jesus said, he fell as lightning. Lightning goes fast. Just That's the idea there. It was a quick fall. He is now given a short time before he and his angels, who are reserved in everlasting chains of darkness, are cast into the lake of fire where their torment shall be forever and ever. His rebellion and his arrogance cost him dearly. However, this is not how Jesus became seated at the right hand of God. He did not rebel against the Father. He obeyed the Father. And did his will, fully submitting to him, accomplished what the Father gave him to do, and the Father has exalted him for it, and has raised him to a seat far above all others. So when we look into this, let's remember that we're speaking about one who is rightfully crowned king. He is worthy of our praise and attention. God expects us to reverence and obey his son whom he exalted. Far above all principality, power, might, and dominion. Very fitly worded passage. Far above. It doesn't sense merely say he's above all powers. I certainly would not compare the Son of God to King Saul, who was head and shoulders above everyone else. That's too weak of an example. Think of how that sounds. He has placed him head and shoulders above everyone else. That's too low. Too low. Rather, the scriptures say that all things have been all things have been set under Christ's shoulders, his feet. 1 Corinthians 15.27 affirms this, that all things are set under his feet. It's also affirmed in the very next verse of our same passage, speaking of Christ, and I put all things under his feet. Hebrews 2.8 says all things have been placed in subjection under his feet. That's a high position. Christ has been elevated to a place that no other source comes close to. He is now a little higher. There's none that even come close to where he is at. When you think like far above, you don't think like, like that far above is more like way up there <laughs> might have to do this like, <laughs> but that's that's the example here though i mean even the highest we he's placed above the highest authority he's way above not even no one even comes close to that it means there's not there's not what else could this mean other than you know he's infinitely exalted overall it all means that he's in no danger of being usurped overthrown or replaced there's no possibility of this happening no one can even reach where he is at. There will never be any threat of Jesus being conquered or defeated. He is above all and far more powerful and strong. There will never be one more qualified than he is. The Father has given him all power in heaven and in earth. It also means that there's none that are not subject to him. He's above all and has authority over all others. Now, unfortunately, some men are unsure whether this passage speaks about like authority like of kings and magistrates on the earth or authorities in heaven. Well, some versions do translate this passage to say, like, ruler, authority, power, and leader. That's how they rank those four. And verses like that, I feel, leave us with the impression that earthly powers are the point. But don't get me wrong. Jesus is the governor among the nations. And that's true. And there are such things as higher powers and authorities in the earth. But I don't believe this is the main point. Although I suppose it is, excluded, it is included to a certain extent. Jesus said, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. That's Matthew 28.10, which shows that principal, spiritual principalities and powers are subject to him as well. There are such things as principalities and powers in heavenly places. There is such a thing as that. 
There are also such things as principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. So this is like bigger than just his rule in the, what we see. It's rule in the spiritual realm as well. Whether they be good or evil, they are all subject to the Son of God. Even as James says, even the demons believe and tremble. So even in the heavenly realm, no one can compete with Christ or resist his power. It only makes sense that all are subject to him, seeing that all things were created by him and for him. This is actually stated in Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Here we go. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So there you have it, straight in Scripture. The principalities and powers that we know, they are created for Christ too. Amen. Now first he says he's above all principality. Sometimes you read other versions, you might get some odd things, but this is what some of them said. Some say he's above all rule, rulers, government, king, command, and forces, and one that managed to read galaxies. Whatever this means, I don't know. But principality in English primarily refers to supreme power or sovereignty. Or it refers to a ruler or leader that's invested with what's required to administer. Now in the Greek, this word means beginning or origin. That's the word used there for principality. And in this sense, it refers to the first person or thing in a series. Or the leader or first in rank. So when you read principality in you don't think like the mayor of the town. You think like the top authority, the one who runs everyone else, the one that everyone else is subject to. That's principality. First in rank, top order. Now on earth we have leaders and rulers who are over us, people that we have to submit to and obey. But even the highest ruler in this world is very small when compared to Christ. An example of a leader, like let's look at the spiritual realm aspect of this. What would be like a, spir a spiritual principality that we can look to like as an example of this? I thought an example of a leader of high rank in heaven would be like Michael, who fought with the dragon. He has charge over angels. It's Michael and his angels. He has charge over a number. He's actually known as an archangel, which is thought to be like an angel of the highest order. In the wicked realm, Saint would be considered a principality. He leads forces of darkness. The angels that are with him, they're called his angels. They fought with the dragon and his angels. There's a lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels, meaning they're subject to him. I mean, he took a third of all the angels in heaven on his side. So we're not talking like a small group here. He has many who are under him, even rulers of darkness. The idea here is all who rule, command, or lead are subject to the Son of God. Those who rule are ruled by the Son of God. Those who command are commanded by the Son of God. Those who lead are led by the Son of God. That's the idea here. Whether it be kings in the earth or whether it be angels or evil spirits, they are all inferior to him and are subject to him in every sense. Christ is said to be the head of all principality and power. That's actually stated in Colossians 2.10. He's also said he's the captain of our salvation. Captain, that's a leader. That's a principality. Which is this, and he's also said to have suffered in the flesh that he might bring us to God. Like, that's leading. That's him taking up the task. Jesus even admonished that if any man come after him, that he take up his cross and follow him. Get behind me. That's That's... The words of one who leads. So Jesus is the head over all principalities in the sense that he has authority over all things and no one, has, and no one else has authority power like he has. He is far above principality in the sense that he can, lead other, he can lead us where others can't. He can do what others can't do. No rule or leadership compares to that of Christ. He is far above all principality. Next it says he's above all power. Other versions read authority or potentate, which is a person who possesses great power. That's it's an older word, but that's what it means. In English, the word power means to strain or exert force. In the Greek, we have an interesting one. It says, power of choice, liberty of doing as one pleases. Physical or mental power, the power of rule of government. Those who are said to have power over something, they have liberty to do what they want in that area. Like if one has been given power over a city, he can do with that city as he pleases. Or if one is power to command an army. He has the authority and liberty to do, make those soldiers do as he wants. You can only do what you want to the extent that you have power. Now those in the world certainly do not have a great deal of power when compared to those in the spiritual realm. Men have power over armies, cities, nations, countries, business. 
But that's as far as you can go in the world. There are angels that are said in the book of Revelation who have power over water and fire. Think on that. And the devil is referred to as the prince of the power of the air and is also said to have had the power of death before Christ destroyed him. The power that Christ has exceeds the power of all others. He has liberty to do whatever he pleases within divine purpose. It is said of Christ that he's been given power over all flesh. Consider that. He's also the head of all principality and power, which includes powers in the spiritual realm as well. He has power over flesh so that he might give eternal life to as many as God has given him. Jesus said that those who believe in him, they have eternal life. That's his own words. And this is an example of his power that he has over all men. He has liberty to give men eternal life. He has that power. Nothing hindering him. Well, consider this one. Jesus told Peter when he tried to defend him, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? How's that for power? That's the kind of power that Jesus has. That's Jesus being taken captive and <laughs> led away to his death. That's, that's what he said in that state. So he, he also has power to judge, seeing that the father has committed all judgment to the son. All judgment. That's a lot of liberty he's given Christ. He has power to save and destroy. He has the liberty to say, come, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. He has the liberty. There's the power to say that. And he also has the authority to say, depart from me, ye wicked. That's what he's been given. The idea here is Christ is not limited in what he can do. His power exceeds the power of all others, and his will is over the will of others. Next we have he's over all might. Other versions read virtue or power. In English, this word means strength, force, power, primarily and chiefly bodily strength or physical power, as to work and strive with all one's might. In Greek, it means strength, power, and ability also. Now, here's how this word's used in Scripture. God did say unto the law, this is Deuteronomy 6, 5, to love him with all thy might. That's how he used it. And Jesus, when quoting this same thing said all thy strength Solomon wrote whatever thy hand findest to do do it with all thy might that's how he said that and Paul admonishes us to be strong in the Lord in the power of his might so might in the sense of our passage refers to strength and ability the stronger a person is the more that they can accomplish the stronger one is the less difficult their tasks become now going back over some of the things that we've looked over In order to lead, one must be a leader or first in rank. In order to do certain things, rulers must have power and liberty to do those things. And strength here would be like what is used to accomplish what you desire to do. One can be strong in the sense that he accomplishes his objectives with little ease. Or in the sense that he's consistent and doesn't break under pressure or show signs of weakness. Now I'll go straight to some examples of spiritual might. You know I mean? If you want to look at it, like point to like a man in the scripture that was my you could think of like samson killed a thousand men with a bone i'd say that's a good example of might strength but then again let's look at the spiritual realm spiritual powers think of the angel that destroyed sennacherib's army 185,000 men that's a lot more than samson killed that would be a pretty good example of might. And just some other examples, angels are often presented as being strong. Like angels guarded the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve were cast out. Balaam faced an angel that stood before him with a sword in his hand. When David numbered the people, an angel was sent to destroy Jerusalem. An angel shut the mouths of the lions in the den that Daniel was cast into. An angel smote all the firstborn in Egypt. Angels fought with the devils and his angels and won. Even Israel was told concerning the angel that led them, Beware of him. Listen to his voice and provoke him not. See, I mentioned these guys to show that angels aren't like the kind of beings you want to mess around with. They're powerful beings. Strong, mighty, and very, very able to accomplish what God gives them to do. Now, forces of darkness have shown that they are stronger than men also. The gathering demoniac could testify of that. Sons of Sceva. I know who Christ is. I know who Paul is. Who are you? Who proved to be stronger in that scenario? So, I mean, that's, be, that's a good example showing. I mean, they do have power. They have might. They are strong beings. Men have been helpless to resist the power of evil spirits. Satan himself was able to bring all kinds of calamity upon God's servant Job. He showed he, he has power too. 
But the might of angels and evil spirits don't match the strength of Christ. The idea here is that the power of Christ is superior to all the strength of others, whether they be in heaven or in earth. No one can accomplish what he can do. None can match his strength or his abilities at the right hand of God. None are more fit for the work that he has to do. Hence the scriptures say, and if you read this up, this is Revelation 5, 12, you'll see it said with a loud voice. So, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Strength was in there, you noticed. <laughs> worthy to receive strength. And the last it says here, dominion. Overall dominion. Other versions say like lordship, domination, kings, and control. And in English, the word means sovereign or supreme authority. The power of governing and controlling. That's, that's what dominion is. And in Greek, it means dominion, power, or lordship. And in the sense of a passage, it refers to those who possess realms and have power over them, governing and running them as they see fit. Now, in the matter of salvation, taking just a slight different approach to this one, men were dominated by the powers of darkness. They, they were controlled by the powers of darkness. They were dominated by sin and death. Our adversary had control over us, and we could not free ourselves. Although wicked forces had control, it was only limited. Thank, praise the Lord. Christ took away sin and freed us from the law of sin and death. It is said that of Jesus that death has no more dominion over him. That is, since he raised from the dead, death can't touch him or affect him any longer. Amen. It is said that of those in Christ that sin shall not have dominion over them. It's not under the law, but they're under grace. Amen. That's a good word. Amen. It is also said of Christ... To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. The idea here is that Christ has authority over all lords who have control or dominance, as well as the control over all things. All who have been given authority to govern are at the feet of Jesus, who sits at the right hand of God. Hence, he's rightfully named King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He has total control, not limited control. That's the idea. There may be those who have run nations, those, those in the heavenly realms. They have control in certain areas, but even them, they can't stop what Christ is doing. Christ has control over them. Also here, it says that he, every name that is named. Other versions say every title that is given, or every name that can be conferred, or like this one, any name that can ever be used. This refers to authoritative titles that are conferred on some personality, like some examples would be like king. Lord, ruler. The idea here is that all who are named rulers are subject to Jesus and that there is no authoritative title that compares to the one that's been given to him. He is the ultimate authority and king. This is shown in his name. The scriptures say in Philippians 2, 10, 11 that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. Well, when Jesus comes, every man sees him for sees him for who he is, no one's going to say, well, we don't serve Jesus. We don't bow the knee to him. We serve this God over here. Or some say, well, we don't believe in Jesus. We think that that's just some show. No, no, everyone's going to bow the knee. Everybody. No matter what their creed is or their religion or whatever they may have professed, they're all going to be bowing when Jesus shows up. Normally when the rulers, like when, normally when like, you, a name of a ruler is declared, only those that are subject to that ruler bow the knee. Like you might think like a an authority in Egypt, only those in Egypt would bow to him. Or in the U.S., you know, we have examples like this. But in the name of Jesus, no matter what your rank may be, everyone bows. Even the highest ranks of heaven and earth will have no choice but to humble themselves before their king, who rules with a scepter of righteousness. They won't hesitate to submit to him. Lastly, it says, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. In other versions, they say age instead of world, meaning like he's not only above all authority in this period of time in which we live. The world we live in, it's destined for destruction. It is said that the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are in, shall be burned up. That's, that's what's happening to our earth soon. Christ's exaltation doesn't end when the world is destroyed. It's not just fit for this world only. Rather, it goes on for all eternity. Christ is not over all temporarily, but forever. He will always be above, far above all principality, power, might, and dominion. Hence the scriptures say, to him be glory and dominion forever. That goes on past this world. Now in conclusion, I exhort you not to be content 
with a minimal or small view of Christ. Christ must be seen for what he is. He's a king. He is a king. It must be known that he has rule over all rulers, and that he has complete control over all. That has to be known. Let us not forget the greatness of our Lord and Savior, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, and then will continue to deliver. Praise and honor to the King of Kings, I say.